Zacchaeus was a wee little man, wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, for the Lord he wanted to see. And as a savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. <laughs>
nearly run. My strongest trials now are past. My triumph is begun. Oh, come, angel band, come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. I know I'm near in holy ranks of friends and kindred dear. I brush the dew of Jordan's banks, the crossing must be near. Oh, come, angel band, come and around me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. I've almost gained my heavenly home. My spirit loudly sings, the holy ones, behold, they come, I hear the noise of wings. Oh, come, angel band, come and around me stand, oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear my longing heart to him who bled and died for me, whose blood now cleanses from all sin and gives me victory. Oh, come, angel band. Come and around me stand, oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal Number six.
24. sang this song a long time just here at church but um, I hadn't practiced it either I just had it on my mind the other day and I thought about it again this morning so when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. 
not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Once again, good morning. Turn your Bible with me, with you, with me this evening, this morning. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm feeling that better 66 year old than that. Can't talk, can't think. Pray for me. I'll come at your prayers. Pray. If you don't have anything in the world you can pray for, pray for me. I need your prayers. I promise you that I do. All right. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. We'll read the first four verses of this chapter. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, they asked this question. Now, this was soon after Christ had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Could it have been maybe there was a little jealousy? amongst all the others that he only took them and didn't take all the rest of them? Think about it. So they began to wonder, well, are they going to be in a more uh, elevated position than I am when this kingdom comes? This morning we want to talk about pride. You know, the Bible speaks to the things that the carnal nature is composed of, made up of. There's the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh, and then there's the pride of life. Now, it exists within each and every one of us. Ambition. Striving to be better at something than other people. We're all that way. Everybody's that way. Are we not? Sure we are. Everyone wants to be successful. Everyone wants to be noticed and acknowledged when they have accomplished something. Do they not? Well, sure they do. You can say, well, it doesn't matter to me. Yes, it does. Don't lie. It does matter to you. It matters to everybody because that's your nature. You know, I could stand up here this morning and talk about, oh, what do you think about these disciples thinking like that? But no, we're not going to talk about them. We're going to talk about us. Because we have the very same problem that they had. So, you know, in saying things like that, think about that when you're saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter to you. Yes, you do care. Because you're a human being. You've got a sinful nature. But what we need to do is acknowledge the fact we have that problem and be willing to humble ourselves in order to receive more grace to be able to do the things God would have us to do. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And people say, oh, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It matters to everybody because you're a human being. If it didn't matter to you, then you'd already be perfect, and you're not perfect. It does matter. Each and every one of us, we need to admit that. We need to acknowledge that. We need to ask God to enable us to overcome that. We need to ask God, in other words, to humble us. And I don't know if anybody likes to be humble, do you? Have you ever met anybody who says, boy, I'm glad I lost. Boy, I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't do this. No, nobody likes to be humble. Nobody. It's not a very pleasant experience to the carnal man, is it? No, it's not. Nobody likes to say I'm wrong. Nobody will say, it's my fault. Oftentimes we'll say it, but we hate saying it though, don't we? Because that's our nature. That's who you are. Each and every one of us. We all, this preacher, you, we need to be humbled. And we're going to talk about what humility is. Because we all have this selfish ambition within inside us to be acknowledged, to be 
better at other people at this and better at other people. That's just who you are. That's just the way that it is. Denying it doesn't help you one bit. You must be willing to be honest with yourself. Say, yes, God, it's me. Yes, God, that's me. Lord, I'm proud and I'm arrogant. I need more humility brought into my life. I have a problem with pride. I'll admit it. I know it exists. I know it's there. I need to be humble. And I'm going to tell you, my friend, many times in my life I've experienced it. God has humbled me. He's brought me right back down to where I needed to be. At the time, it wasn't very pleasant. At the time, I didn't like it very well. But when you look back upon it, you say, thank you, Jesus. You put me in my place. You showed me who I am. You revealed some things to me about myself I wasn't willing to admit, didn't want to acknowledge, didn't want to recognize. But God, thank you that you did. We need to be humbled. They needed to be humbled. To ask a question such as this reveals their ambition and their desire to be in an elevated position, does it not? Who's the greatest? If they didn't care, they wouldn't ask the question, would they? Now think about it. If they didn't really care, they would have never asked this question, but it did matter to them because they asked the question, didn't it? Notice what Jesus does in verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted... And become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying here? First, before you can even gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be converted. And how do you become converted? What's the first step? Is being humble. The first step is what? Acknowledging your sinfulness. Acknowledging that you're wrong. Acknowledging that you're lost. Acknowledging that you're a failure. That's the first step, isn't it? Realizing I can't help myself. I can't do anything to save myself. I'm hopeless and I'm helpless. That's the first step. That's humility, isn't it? Submitting, yielding, being beaten down, acknowledging and realizing I am nothing. I am nothing. And you are nothing without God. That's the first step. You've got to be willing to admit your sinfulness. What the scriptures teach about each and every one of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, no one lives a good enough life to go to heaven. Nobody. We've got to be willing to admit that, to acknowledge that about ourselves. Lord, I'm lost. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I can't earn my way into heaven. Lord, I deserve to die and to go to hell. That's humility. And that's what Christ is saying. You've got to be converted first. But once you reach that point, you realize that. God says, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Humble yourself, realizing you need someone, you need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus, my friend. Trusting in what he did for you that you couldn't do for yourself on Calvary's cross is paying your sin debt through his death and accepting him as your Lord and Savior. That's conversion, my friend. That's being born again. That's being ushered into the kingdom of heaven through faith, not in yourself, but in what Jesus did. And Christ says, that's the first thing. And you've got to do like a little child would do. And we'll talk about that. Why do you use a child as an example? Think about it. Let's think for just a moment. Why would Jesus take this little child and use it as an example to his followers at this time? Now, even after you're converted, even after you believe and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've gotten to the point where you've humbled yourself and realized your lost condition and you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Does that 
pride just automatically disappear and go away. No, it doesn't. It's part of your nature. Part of your nature. You have to learn to allow God to overcome that and to allow God's Spirit to beat down that old carnal man that still exists in each and every one of us. Everybody has that same issue they must deal with, even believers. As I said, no one likes to be humble. We resist that. We don't want that. We don't desire that, do we? We want to be exalted. We want to be lifted up. We want to be successful. We want to be recognized. That's our nature. That's who we are. But the reason he uses a child is this. A child is humble. Aren't they? Sure. They're submissive to their parents, are they not? They yield. They don't try to impose their will over their parents' will, do they? They submit to the will of their parents. A little child does, don't they? Sure they do. They have faith in mom and dad, don't they? They believe in them, don't they? Until they grow up and find out, you know, mom and dad aren't always truthful evil, though, are they? You know, mom and dad aren't perfect. Now, when they're little, they think they are, though, don't they? At that point in their life. But then they rose and they said, you know, and that's just part of life. That's just, that's what, that's, that's what's, that's going to happen. And you can't change that. That's just the way that it is. That's the way that it is. But in the beginning, they're submissive to mom and dad, aren't they? They don't try to overrule or override mom and dad. They trust mom and dad, do they not? They believe in mom and dad. They accept that. That's what he's talking about. That's humility, isn't it? Is acknowledging that someone is superior to you. That someone knows more than you know. That someone is better than you are. Isn't that what humility really, when you think that's all about? That's why Christ is saying, look, you want to become like this little child. Instead of being so selfishly ambitious about who's the greatest, who's this, and who's that. Look at this little child right here. Use this child as an example of what humility truly is all about, isn't it? It's humbling yourself before the Lord, acknowledging his lordship, acknowledging his greatness, realizing your weakness, your inability to do anything apart from him and becoming totally dependent upon your Heavenly Father for all things. That's humility. See, when we're independent and self-sufficient, that's the opposite of humility, isn't it? That's pride. I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. I can do it myself. No, you can't. No, you can't. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs God. I care who you are. Everybody. But you see, that's tough for us, isn't it? Tough for me. Tough for me to admit, I need people. I need other people. I need, we all have this desire to be independent, strong, independent people. Well, at the end of the day, everybody needs the Lord. Everybody. Don't care who you are. Everybody. Who is the greatest, they said. Who's going to be the greatest? And Christ says, the one that has the mentality of this little child will be the greatest. The one who is dependent upon God. The one who trusts God. The one who submits and yields to God. That's the greatest. That's the greatest. That's how he answered their question by giving them an example of a little child at this time. Humility. As I said previously, you've got to humble yourself before you can be saved. You do? If you don't, you're never going to turn to Christ in faith. If you're not willing to admit your sinfulness, you're not willing to admit your, your, your hopelessness, and realize that you can't do anything about it, and acknowledge that fact and turn to Jesus, and you can't be saved. 
You can't be saved. You're not saved through your good works. You're not saved by coming to church. You're not saved by reading your Bible. You're not saved by doing, we could go on and on and talk about the things we do as Christians. Those things don't save you. They don't have anything to do with your salvation. When you think that they do, that's your pride and ego wanting to puff yourself up and to make yourself feel good about yourself. Look what I'm doing. Those things have nothing to do with it. They're a result of it, but they're not part of it. What Jesus did at Calvary is the only thing that saves you. Don't take no credit for it. And all the credit goes to Jesus. He paid your sin debt on Calvary's cross. Gave himself for you that you might have eternal life. That's the only way you can get saved. Is by humbling yourself and acknowledge your hopelessness and turning to Jesus in faith and trusting in him. That's salvation, my friend. It has been, you add nothing to it. You add nothing to it. Nothing at all. Don't think that you do because you don't. Nothing. You know, we need grace every day of our lives. Each and every one of us do, don't we? Would you not agree with that? Do you, you, you think you can make it without the grace of God? I can't. I can't. Can't do anything apart from the grace of God. Well, how do you, how does God give you that, that how does God give more grace? Hmm? Grace comes through humility. Turn with me to James chapter 4 and verse 6. James chapter 4 and verse 6. You, we've been studying this in our Sunday school class. We looked at this last week, this scripture last week, about the fussing and the fighting and the quarreling that that group was doing amongst one another. And James referred to it. Well, let's read it. We'll, we'll start in, in verse 1 just to refresh our memories from the Sunday school. He tells him, from which comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Oh, why do people fight? Why do people quarrel? Why, do people not, why are people not able to get along with one another? Because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's why they can't, isn't it? And it happens. We're human beings. It's just the way that it is. Don't think you can get through life without having some kind of a disagreement or a issue as you go through life. It's part of life, isn't it? And it's part of us, isn't it? But we'll look at it here and see. There's a way you can overcome it. But you can't overcome it. You have to let God enable you to overcome it. He says in verse 2, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Praying for the wrong things. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, here, look, here is what overcomes all this. This is what does it right here. But God, but he giveth more grace. It is the grace of God that enables us if we'll allow God to work in our lives and to move in our lives. And that comes through humility. Humbling yourself. As I said before, no one wants to do that. Because here's our problem as human beings. It's my problem, it's your problem. We don't think we're ever wrong. We don't. We don't think we're ever wrong. Everybody else is wrong, I'm right. That's the way we think, isn't it? Sure it is. I'm always right. But you're not. I'm not. We're wrong more than we're right. Boy, I'm not going to humble myself in midday. I'm not going to eat no crow. You think I'm going to say I'm wrong? Oh, no, I won't do it. I'm too proud for that. I die first. 
I'll go to my grave before I'll say that. That's, some people think like that. I ain't wrong. I ain't wrong. Well, my friend, we're all wrong. Every one of us. That's exactly what the problem is. But God's grace can overcome that. But how, how are you going to get that grace? Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. If you have that mentality, you're never wrong. What does it say? God resisteth you, doesn't it? God's not working and moving your life. But giveth grace to the humble. To the one who says, Lord, I am wrong. I am wrong. Then that's when God imparts that grace that empowers you to live in this world that we're in right now. All oh, grace is an abundant supply. It's never ending, my friend. Isn't it? Sure is. God's grace never runs out. You see, the problem is we won't humble ourselves. We won't truly humble ourselves and say, God, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I need your grace, Lord. I need your strength. I need your power, God. That's the problem. Isn't it? I guarantee you this. It has me. Lack of humility has robbed me of many blessings in my life. I admit it. I have a problem with it. Lack of humility will rob you of many blessings in your life. Just simply because that old sinful nature just cannot stand to say I'm wrong. Well, it's not my fault. We use that excuse in every aspect of life. For example, Ball's hit. God makes error. What happened? Son got my eyes. Wind was blowing from left to right. We could talk and talk and talk and use thousands of examples in life when we do something wrong, but it's not our fault. It's not, it's not our fault. Someone else's or some things fault in it. I, I did. What? Boy, we lost a close ball game. Whew. Two points. Them dad burn referees, they wasn't worth a hoot. <laughs> they cost us the ball game. They made so many bad calls. <clears throat> you shot 10 for 30 from the foul line, and you lost a two-point game. Yeah, blame the referees for that. That's their fault, isn't it? You say, nobody, I don't care, wants to admit they failed. Nobody. We'll look for every kind of excuse, every reason in the world to say why we didn't succeed. It's always somebody else's fault. That's the pride of life that exists within each and every one of us. And what Jesus said here, you need to humble yourself. You need to realize you're not always right. You make mistakes. You're wrong sometimes. Admit it. Admit it. And God says, I'll pour my grace into your life then. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So you see, we could stand up here and give these, these 12 down the road for what they said and the question they asked what Christ said to them. But no, how's that going to help you? <clears throat> His friend told me one time a preacher was up preaching and someone in the congregation said, hey man, brother, Tell them about it. They need to hear it. Didn't say we needed to hear it. They needed to hear it. See, that's the problem, isn't it? We all need to hear this. I need to hear this. You need to hear this. Having a humble spirit. Being willing to say, look, I'm wrong. You'll be willing to say it to God. You'll be willing to say it to everybody. I'm wrong. And quit making excuses to why you are wrong. 
When I sin, and I sin quite often, more than I want to, I strive to allow God and the Spirit to enable me to, but I sin. I sin. And when I sin, my first initial reaction is to try to find someone or something to blame. When I lose my temper, and I have a bad temper, when I lose my temper, I'm looking for someone or something to blame as to what? No. No. That's my fault. When I say something I shouldn't say, no, that's my fault. When I do something I shouldn't do, that's my fault. It's not looking to say, look what you made me say. Look what you made me do. No. No. I did it. I did it. But initially, it first happens, someone else's fault. I, 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 you know, I don't make mistakes. I'm, I'm not wrong. Got to be some other ex, you know, something else that makes me fail. I, I don't, yeah, you do fail. You know, our problem is this. We need to confess it, acknowledge it, and ask God helps overcome. I say there's not very many people here today would know this name that I'm about to throw out there to you, Mac Davis. Arzella raised her hand. Anybody know Mac Davis? He used to sing a few songs on the country radio and he'd done a little acting in Hollywood. That's been a long time ago. <laughs> but anyway, you remember that song he had? Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. That's the way people think. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking every day. That's human nature, isn't it? That's you. He's singing about you, isn't he? He's singing about me, and yes, he is. Don't hold your head down and say, oh, you don't. Yes, that's the truth. We all think that way. Every one of us. Lord, it's hard to be humble, but he adds, I'm doing the best I can. Really. Really. Think about it. Every one of us could use a big old dose of humility, couldn't we? We could. I could. Be humble. Be genuinely humble. There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. I don't believe in being confident in the Lord's ability to take you and use the gifts He's given you to be successful. I don't believe. I don't believe that's. I don't, I don't think that's. A, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because God wouldn't have given you that gift if He didn't expect you to use it. I believe that. And there's nothing wrong with being confident in the gifts God's given you and your ability as long as you realize and understand they're coming from the Lord and I'm going to give him the credit for it. I'm going to use an example from Scripture. David, shepherded sheep. Well, he had to fend off wild animals, didn't he? He did. And here's what, here's not, now, you can't do anything, you can't, you can't be good anything unless you practice it. I don't care what it is. got to practice it. Well, the sling. Now, I'm not talking about a slingshot. I'm talking about the sling where they would put a rock and something wrong like this cloth and swing it like that and know how to release it exactly to hit the target. That, that, that'd be tough. Think about that. That's hard enough to do with the arm, isn't it? Sure it is. But you add to that the extra leverage of the sling because you get more speed like that and be able to release that and hit your target with it. You'd have to practice that, wouldn't you? Well, that's all he took with him when he went down to fight Goliath. All he had. But David had confidence. I think he was confident in his ability that was given him of the Lord. Because who did he give credit for? He said, he didn't say, I'll tell you what, these hours of practice finally paid off. I practiced, I practiced, I've worked hard. Look what I was able to do. He didn't say that, did he? No, he didn't. He didn't take credit for that, did he? What did he tell him before he went down there and said, this isn't mine or yours. This is the Lord's battle. He gave God the glory for it. So don't be afraid to use the abilities and talent God gave you. Just remember this, though. Here's the point. Give God credit for it when it happens. Because it wouldn't happen without the Lord. See, there's a difference. There's a difference. Many times people, I think, mistake humility for people. I won't try to do anything. Well, they're humbly. There's a difference between being humble and being afraid to fail. 
A lot of times people just say, they, they, they don't, don't stop because they're humble, they're just afraid to fail. I mean, seriously, you think about it. Don't be afraid to do what God wants you to do. Praise God, give him glory, give him credit for it. But listen, stay humble. Stay humble. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, no way you can go to heaven and humble yourself. You've got to admit your sin, acknowledge it, realize and understand you're going to die and you're going to go to hell unless you turn to someone who can save you. And that someone is Jesus. You've got to learn to admit your sin first, though. Turn to Christ in faith and accept and trust in Him. And Christians, I don't pride of life. It just don't disappear, does it? It don't. It doesn't. Hard for us to stay humble, isn't it? It is. But if you want to receive grace, that empowers you, that enables you to do all that God would want you to do, you better stay humble. You better be willing to, to say, look, I make mistakes. I am wrong. I do fail. Because we do. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. We thank you, dear God, once again for blessing us and allowing us to be here this morning. And Lord, I pray for this one here today, Lord, if someone that hears this message that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that God, they would turn to him in faith this morning and receive him as their personal Savior. And God, help me, Lord, to be humble and to stay humble and to remain humble, God. God, I pray for myself that you would hinder Satan. God, prevent him from puffing up my ego and my pride. God, that you would keep my eyes open to the fact, God, I am nothing apart from you. But that, God, I can do all things through you who <coughs> gives me the strength that you would have me to do. Thank you, and I praise you this morning, God, for your salvation. Now, God, as we sing a song of invitation, I pray that you would move in our hearts and move in our lives, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So stand out and we'll sing a song of invitation. Page 385. Savior's death on Calvary's cross. And I'm going to tell you why. We don't even like to accept responsibility and 
deal with the consequences of something that we done, do we? We don't. Much less someone else's. That's humility. Jesus didn't deserve to die, did he? He didn't deserve to suffer, did he? But he did, didn't he? For you and I. That's humility, my friend. Pray God gives that to each and every one of us. That kind of humility. Good to see you this morning. You don't have one before we dismiss anybody. Anyone? Anybody have word this morning before we dismiss anybody? All right, good to see you this morning. Praise God for your presence. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, my brother, uh, Valentine's, he, he, he passed away last Sunday from uh, COVID. And then they checked him further and he had cancer of the esophagus. And they checked him, you know, they wanted to see why he, you know, didn't make it through it. And besides the COVID, you know, which is very bad. And they found he had cancer uh, and all down in his esophagus. So, but I ask prayer for that family out there. Amen. Okay. Let's remember that family in prayer. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right then. Joy Drew dismisses. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again. through the day, guide us and keep us, and let us always be a, a light in the dark world.